Hello, hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi. How's it going? We'll give everyone like five or so minutes to flood on in. How's everyone doing on the panel? What's up? I know we just saw each other, but like we have to have a new conversation. So <laughs> <Kyle. laughs> I'm John and I'm hanging in there. It's been a busy Monday. Yeah. Well, it's final week for me now. Yeah. Well, it's, it's getting grueling. Here too at UNC. Oh, oh I like Tar Heel blue sweater too. Do you have oh, to like nice. grade papers? Well, I taught a graduate class this semester, so I don't have any fine. They don't have finals. Um, oh, okay. So I, yeah, I don't have to grade stuff this semester. What so. a power rush that must be. <laughs> <laughs> you have so much authority. Uh, Jim, do you, have, do you have students? you teach classes? Uh, I only do like guest lecturing, so I'm kind of lucky. I don't have much, uh, very little teaching or grading to do myself. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be a teacher? Um, I would like to, it's a really, a huge time commitment. And so I'm kind of more focused on research, but I do look forward to, to someday teaching more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like, I feel like you can just pass it off to TAs. <laughs> well, they don't like when you do that. This, the, the, you have uh, students evaluate at the end of the year, they evaluate your class at the end of the semester, they fill out these forms and stuff. So you really do it, which is good. It keeps you, it keeps you honest. You, you can't completely shirk your responsibilities as a professor. Otherwise you'll get feedback and that could have ramifications in terms of promotion raises, things like that. All right. Yeah. Well, oh, that's important. It's important. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> Teaching is an important mission. Um, actually, Kim, I've, when I was like 13, my mom made me watch CBT school. I shouldn't have said it like made me watch. <laughs> but I didn't know that. That's really yeah. exciting. Yeah. So I've known your name since for about seven years now. <laughs> wow. I had no idea. That's actually really wonderful to hear. It, like, your name in my family is like untouchable. It's up there with like John Hirschfield and Jonathan Abramowitz and Jim Crow. <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> of course. Sorry. That is an amazing um, compliment. Thank you. Um, oh, people are coming in. Hello, everyone. If you want to comment where you're from, too, where you're streaming from, that would be cool. I like to know where everyone is. Medford, Massachusetts. You know what I learned the other day? That. Worcester, Massachusetts is pronounced Wooster. Wooster, yeah. Yeah, that's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's not spelled that way. Like Arkansas. Right. Or Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> but isn't it it's spelled Worcestershire? It's yeah. not spelled Worcestershire. <laughs> Worcestershire. <laughs> Kimberly, did you did you do you pronounce Arkansas or Kansas? No, I mean, I'm a good American now. I, I figured it out. It took me many years. I There's like a really famous um, meme of someone pronouncing it Arkansas. And I get it. Like, that's how it's spelled. I don't get why we say Arkansas. Right. We like say Kansas. Yeah. Right. Tortilla. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the, the hard one for me to wrap my head around when I moved to America. Do they call it Tortilla in Australia? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so, but I remember I was very young, like a young, young adult when I came. So I think I just read everything as it sounded. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you guys, wait, if you don't say the word tortilla, do you not have the magic of tacos? Well, it's interesting. I think back, I mean, I've lived in America for 20 years and I think back then it was only just becoming cool. Mexican food. Ah, uh, yeah. Tacos are just becoming hip. That's my favorite food. Me too. Here, it's like amazing. There is someone from Tasmania. I who, just yeah. saw that. Yeah. If you wanna, Tally. if you wanna tell us how often you eat tacos, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. We can, um, we can. But okay, it is five minutes past, so I think it's about time to get started. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the second research roundtable. My name is still Kyle. Um, <laughs> and I'm still hosting with my good buddy, John, who's, I guess, to that way on my screen. Um, wait, 
I have tacos every week on Tuesday. Perfect. Taco Tuesday. That's also when I eat tacos with my family. Um, but anyway, uh, my name is Kyle. I'm a sophomore studying neuroscience at Yale University with a particular focus on OCD and related disorders. I want to be a researcher, but researching is annoying. <laughs> and um, on any given research topic, there is a lot of stuff and it's all in papers that are really complicated to read, like the ones that I'm going to get Jim to explain to me today. Um, and when I go to a topic and want to learn more about it, I always wish that there was someone to explain it to me. Um, so the goal of this program is to pick out a particular topic in the literature and to discuss it, dissect it, and break it down in a way that anyone can understand with experts in the field. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass off to my co-host, John, to introduce himself. Yeah, so I'm still John Abramowitz, um, although sometimes I wonder about that. Uh, and I am a clinical psychologist at University of North Carolina. I teach in the psychology and neuroscience department and uh, do some clinical work. And I, I do research and I also do um, clinical stuff. So I am at the intersection of all these fun things. Um, uh, yeah, in OCD and, and all this stuff. So I'll leave it at oh, that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure people see that there are two other people here. But before we get to those other people on the screen, I do want to make two announcements. First, um, this live stream is intended to serve as educational content and is not intended to replace therapy. For treatment related questions, please be sure to work with your local provider or contact a local clinician. The International OCD Foundation is not a crisis hotline mm -hmm. and should not be used if you are in distress or feel unsafe. If you're in a crisis or you're ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please go to your local emergency room call 911 or call the suicide prevention hotline at 800-273-8255. I'd also like to say that we just want to make sure that this is as safe a space as possible. Um, so please be kind and respect everyone. This broadcast is being recorded. It's going to be live on various social media platforms and stay up on social media afterwards. There is a live chat feature. Um, so please be cautious and careful on what you say and just be kind and compassionate. Um, and also there's a chat feature for a reason, please. We have a lot of really cool people here who know a lot of stuff about these, this topic. Um, so if you have questions, please, please ask them. Um, but getting to the cool pe people, I'm going to start with Jim because he's directly under me. Um, let me pull up my document of Jim's the facts about Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so underneath me is Dr. Jim Crowley. He is an associate professor in the Department of Genetics and Psychiatry at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's also affiliated with the Department of Clinical Neuroscience at the Karolinska, Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. His re research focuses on psychiatric genomics of OCD, Tourette syndrome, and related disorders. He's the last author on one of the publications to be discussed today entitled Examination of the Shared Genetic Bases of anorexia nervosa and obsessive compulsive disorder. He's also an author on the other paper we're gonna talk about, but he didn't know that until about five minutes ago. <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jim, how are you doing? <laughs> Great, yeah, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. And yeah, please ask all the questions you like. I'm gonna be asking a lot of questions because genetics is dope and I don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool, we'll make it make sense. And uh, to his left, I think, um, is Kimberly Quinlan. Kimberly Quinlan is a licensed marriage and family therapist and has a private practice in Calabasas, California, specializing in, in anxiety, OCD, and related disorders and eating disorders. Kimberly is the founder of CBTSchool.com, which I recommend, an online psychoeducation platform that provides online courses for those with obsessive compulsive disorder and body-focused repetitive behaviors. Kimberly is the host of Your Anxiety Toolkit podcast and is also the author of the Self-Compassion Workbook for OCD and the host of Your Anxiety Toolkit podcast, a podcast, podcast aimed at providing mindfulness-based tools for anxiety, OCD, depression, and BFRBs. Kim, how are you? Good. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Really, I am. I'm honored to have you. <laughs> um, okay, so today... As you probably know, we're going to be discussing the connections between anorexia and OCD. And I wanted to start it off by um, by kind of giving some context to why at least I pushed for this topic to be the topic we are discussing today. Um, so as I shared last time, I was diagnosed with OCD, with OCD when I was 13. And luckily, I lived very close to a very good treatment facility. 
And through exposure response prevention, I was able to overcome uh, that the contamination OCD. And by the time I was 14, I was living the life that I had before there was any onset of symptoms. And for about five years, I didn't have any mental health issues up until 11th grade when I started uh, to go to the gym with my friends uh, because they started to go to the gym a little bit more. And I went to the gym with them and they were talking about eating healthier. So I started to eat a little bit healthier, nothing too big. And then very quickly, I began going to the gym more and focusing more on about what I was eating. And I began eating less and I began uh, get, putting out more calories by going to the gym and then running after I went to the gym too. And very quickly, my weight dropped to a very dangerous level when I was in, in 11th grade. And my parents uh, freaked out, understandably, and they took me to the same place that I'd been treated for my OCD. And they said, sound the alarms. Our, our, Kyle has his OCDs flared up again. Something's going wrong. Something's going wrong with his OCD. And um, the therapist looked at me and said, no, it's not his OCD. This is anorexia. But... I think if you ask my parents today, you know, was that anorexia or was that OCD, they would have trouble giving you a straight answer because in their minds, it seemed like more or less the same thing. I was obsessing about food instead of obsessing about being contaminated. And I was compulsing by going to the gym instead of compulsing by washing my hands. And if you asked me, having experienced both disorders, I would also say it's really hazy. Mm -hmm. They feel very, very similar. Um, and in both cases, I felt like I was obsessing about one thing and I was compulsing about it. Mm. And it, it's hard to parse it in my mind why they're different diagnoses. Um, but according to the DSM-5, they are different diagnoses. Um, so I really wanted to tackle this question and, and look at and scrutinize how are these disorders similar and how are they different today from my own personal understanding and just because I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and I wanted to start at the most basic level that you could examine a question like this, and that's with genetics. So um, as I said earlier, Jim is an author on a paper called Examination of the Shared Genetic Bases of Anorexia Nervosa and Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. But before we get into that paper, I wanted to ask Jim, what does like the genetic profile of a psychiatric illness look like, right? Like when we look at a, a psychiatric illness, is it like there's one mutation and we're like, oh, bam, got it. Like that's the OCD mutation or w what is it? Yeah, generally not. Um, um, OCD and anorexia are both called complex traits. So they're thought to be influenced by, uh, first of all, a lot of environmental factors. So both of these traits are not entirely genetic. They're about roughly 50% in influenced by genes and about 50% influenced by the environment. So that's really important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, certainly most disorders, uh, psychiatric disorders are not monogenic. They're not one gene. They're not like Huntington's or um, things like that. There are usually hundreds of genes involved. Um, in and is it the genes just go completely bonkers or is it like a little, small little change? Usually um, pretty subtle changes actually. So all of us carry what you'd say OCD risk variants or anorexia risk variants. It's just a matter of how many we carry and how they interact with your environment. Um, so they're generally not very drastic changes, usually very subtle, at least for okay. common variation. Mm -hmm. And if you have like X number of risk variants, how, how, how sure can you be as a geneticist when you say like, oh, this means you'll have X probability of getting this disorder? Can you even make a sentence like that? Not really. It's we follow something called the liability threshold model, uh, where at a certain there's sort of like a bell curve of risk, and at the far, the tail end of having having a lot of genetic risk variants for a disorder, you're at an mm -hmm. increased risk, but it is not deterministic. Um, it's really like your your chance goes up, but it's not. Again, it's not like a, mo a monogenic trait. It's not deterministic like that. Um, so we can't predict um, from a genetic um, a full genome sequence, we can't predict if that person's going to have OCD or anorexia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot more complicated than that. So, And speaking of complications, someone just said in the chat epigenetics. So um, mm. what are epigenetics and do they play a role here as well? Yeah, so epigenetics are um, changes in uh, the DNA itself, uh, not the sequence, but the sort of the function of it. And 
Um, that's kind of where the environment comes in. The environment, like stress or um, things of that sort, can alter your epigenome. And um, it's much more complicated, I would say, than genetics. So we have a lot to learn about it. And um, don't have too much to say about it right now. But uh, more to come, more research to be done there. Fair enough. Um, OK, so getting into this paper, uh, what were you guys trying to do and, and how were you trying to do it? Yeah, the main question is um, are, uh, basically, do OCD and anorexia share genetic risk factors? And so there was the description you gave of your own personal experience and what we've read in the literature suggested that they probably do share genetic risk factors. Um, first of all, they're often comorbid, like in your case. So about one third of anorexia cases have a lifetime history of OCD. So that's much higher than uh, population prevalence. And mm -hmm. around five to 10% of OCD cases have a lifetime history of AN. So it kind of goes both ways. Furthermore, if you look at first degree relatives of anorexia cases, they have a higher risk of OCD and vice versa is also true. So, you know, we've known, like I said before, we've known from twin and family studies that, you know, these traits are about 50% genetic. So again, the key question was, do these disorders share genetic risk factors? Um, mm -hmm. So what we started do, to do was um, to identify specific genetic risk factors. Sorry, I have some notes here. <laughs> <laughs> genetic risk factors for OCD and anorexia. And this was work done over the last say, five or six years. Um, and it's done through a process called genome-wide association studies. So what you do there is you collect DNA from thousands of people that have either anorexia or uh, OCD and mm -hmm. thousands of people that don't. So pretty straightforward. Uh, and then what you do is you examine millions of genetic markers that are spread throughout the genome. So millions of markers spread on every chromosome. Is that just like little like nucleotides? It's yeah, small changes in, uh, so A, T, G, C are the bases of DNA, and it's like mm -hmm. changing an A to a C, a very okay. subtle change. Uh, so we're looking at millions of those spread across the chromosomes. And basically, we look for markers that are more frequent in people with OCD or AN versus people without. Mm -hmm. so again, we all carry risk factors for these disorders. It's just a matter of how many you have, again, and how would they interact with the environment. So in this particular paper, this study, uh, we used these genome-wide association study data to look at the overlap of risk markers between AN and OCD. So we had identified what are the main risk factors. Again, we're looking at overlap of the two. What we found was that around 50% of the risk markers for OCD are shared with AN and vice versa. So that is okay. that's the main finding, and that's pretty important. It says a lot about what might cause these disorders. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, so in other words, the genetic correlation is around 0.5. So in kind of to, to give some context to that number, like how similar are other mental disorders to one another generally? Is this like a really like significant number? That's very high. So we looked at uh, a number of other psychiatric disorders. And for example, depression and OCD, the correlation is around 0.2. So around 20% shared genetic risk factors. Mm -hmm. um, it's 0.5 is, is quite high uh, for two traits. And John and Kim, like in your own practices, do you, do you see a lot of like family history of these disorders kind of coming together? Like you'll be treating someone with OCD and their parent might have anorexia in their past? I I actually don't see a lot of it, but I also I have a relatively small practice. I, you know, kind of like what Jim was saying before, it seems like more you see an OCD among people who have the anorexia rather than anorexia in, in an OCD population. I don't know what Kim's experience is. Yeah, I mean, I see a large percentage, but that's also because I'm known for that those two to be my specialty too. So I think I I would say eighty percent of my clientele has one, unusually both. But that's also a part of they're coming to me for specifically that. What I do find a lot of is people will go to an OCD specialist because OCD is the primary diagnosis. 
and they can manage their their anorexia or their um, the other eating disorder. And then once they've recovered from OCD or gotten somewhat through it, then the eating disorder rages up and gets strong. And then that we that's when we usually see them. So that's a lot of the population that we see. Mm -hmm. And in, in that case, does it seem like the OCD might like mask almost the eating disorder? Well, I think that with, well, in my opinion, mm. I'm, I mean, I will share, I, I don't have OCD, but I did have anorexia. And that's why I so much related to people with OCD because I felt like I had an obsession and I had a compulsion and the cycle was exactly the same. I felt a great sense of comfort learning the obsessive compulsive cycle. Um, like that's exactly. And so what I found is a lot of times compulsions for OCD compulsions do tend to give you some relief in some cases and mm -hmm. that can keep those compulsions strong and alive. Whereas, um, you know, there is when you're restricting or compulsively doing exercise, that can get really messy and cause you a lot of functioning issues. So, you know, I think that OCD can very much mask the symptoms. Um, a lot of people will also, culture really supports anorexia by encouraging yeah. dieting and encouraging compulsive exercise. So often it gets mistreated or, or not treated. Mm -hmm. That yeah, so I was gonna. I mean, but the point that you just made about about culture, I think, is um, is really important, especially with a problem like anorexia that we know is related to to culture. Now, in the study, Jim, it looked like you had data from all over the world. Yeah, exactly. So um, there are samples from all over the world for both OCD and AN. Um, so you know, but a lot of them are from the Western world and um, there's limited diversity, which is one of the main limitations of the study. And something we're trying to rectify now is almost all these samples were from European American ancestry folks. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the goal is to increase diversity and diversity and environmental risk is part of that. That'd be really interesting to, to look at. And yeah, in the, you know, yeah. this is where like the media doesn't influence uh, our perceptions of beauty and all that kind of thing. Body mm -hmm. Would you, yeah, if you would still see these disorders be tangled up in yeah. those cases. Yeah. And Jim, you said, it seemed like you said that, correct me if I'm wrong, if you have a diagnosis of anorexia, it's more, you're more likely to have also a diagnosis of OCD than the other way around. Um, like, well, what the uh, literature says is uh, around one third of AN cases have a lifetime history of OCD. Mm -hmm. uh, five to 10% of OCD cases have a lifetime history of AN. So AN has a lower population prevalence though. So yeah. I think you have to take that into account as well. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's kind of like the way someone might explain that because that kind of struck me. Yeah, I'd say it's, the risk is much higher than population prevalence it, it looks like, yeah. And we just got a question too. Um, from Patricia at 7.23 p.m. Could you describe the environmental risk, risk factors of both? That's for everyone. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I can talk about uh, perinatal risk factors uh, from work from Sweden. Uh, there's been some nice work done by colleagues there that have looked at, um, well, let's see, um, I'm trying to remember the precise risk factors, but I think uh, low birth weight and uh, maternal smoking during pregnancy those are two of the bigger risk factors. Um, and uh, there are many more, I guess, later in life. Uh, I don't know in great detail. I don't know how well the studies are for that, but I would imagine stress is, is a major one, I would think. One of the um, problems with, with the literature is that, you know, a lot of these kinds of risk factors are nonspecific. So it's hard to say if that's, you know, if these things are, are particular, ad ad addressing the question, it's hard to say if these things are particular to OCD or might be risk factors for, you know, lots of different psychological uh, mm -hmm. you know, problems. And we just don't know um, from my perspective. We, yeah, we, there are hypotheses about psychological, experiential, environmental predictors or hypotheses about biological predictors, but no one's done that definitive study experimentally where we can really say that one comes before the other. Um, 
Yeah. So we, I, I just, I don't think we know. I, I don't think yeah. we have any idea about the causes of a problem like, like OCD or anorexia. We have some leads, but. Mm -hmm. so they're incredibly a, complex. It's they're incredibly complex. Like we yeah. were talking about before. It's just not a simple um, question. And I, I think that our resources are better spent looking at, because we do know how to treat these problems. Our research, uh, well, OCD, I think more than anorexia, but um, looking at, treatment luckily we don't need to know the cause in order to um, have good treatments mm -hmm. one thing i would say and i'm not coming from any data here but i think from the eating disorder community what we can do um, in terms of helping reduce the impact or reduce the chances of of you know i always think of i came from a family where eating disorder is high, um, multiple people in my family. So I'm always thinking about my daughter. And, you know, in general, we can say reducing conversations around body, uh, reducing uh, compliments around body can be or, or importance of body. Um, things like having a parent that's not on a diet. These are things that can really help um, not increase the chances, if that makes any sense. Again, this is not from data, but we do know that these are the common things that people with eating disorders rep report that really triggered them. Even Kyle, you were saying like, as you went to the gym, the environment of- My um, friends. Yeah, the environment of that, you know, weight or body being important can be a risk factor for a lot of people with eating disorders. So that's just something to think about. Again, can I prevent my daughter from getting an eating disorder? No, um, but I can be aware of some things that may trigger her or my son because it's men, men, boys and girls alike. And do you kind of like thinking about this in terms of OCD as well, do you feel like there's as strong a... Uh... Do like environmental risk factors play as large a role in OCD? Because I don't think my parents were encouraged by my therapist to like stop washing your hands or mm -hmm. you know stop doing all these cleaning activities when I was uh, when I had contamination OCD. But they certainly were told, "Hey, maybe eat a little bit more when I had anorexia." Right, right. So is there a difference in kind of relative weight of environmental pressures? Maybe I don't know. I mean, that that one I think is very much dependent on the person, their personality traits, you know, multiple things. But I do think clinically, um, I think as a culture, we are encouraged as parents, we're all, you know, as a mom, I was constantly being told by the pediatrician, don't bring up weight and such, but I wasn't told not to wash my hands in front of my kids and I wasn't told to, you know, not scare them in other ways, if that helps. Mm-hmm. Um, Victoria has a question at 726. When you say stress as a perinatal risk factor, how do you operationalize stress? As in an anxiety disorder, general life stress, low SES, trauma stress? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I don't have a very good answer, to be honest. I think, like John said, there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, these studies are very difficult to do. Um, that's part of it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if, John, you have anything else to add? Uh, I don't now, but we are in the middle, like literally in the middle of a five-year study where we're doing a prospective study. We're getting people during pregnancy. We're getting all sorts of information about psychological personality traits, things like that, experiences of stress, as well as lots of biological markers. And we're going to follow these folks through six months of pregnancy. And we're about halfway through now, like I said. And, you know, in a couple of years, we'll be able to say more about that. But, you know, we just we just don't know. Um, yeah, we, we, we just don't know. I mean, I think all of those things, having an anxiety disorder, having general life stress, low SES, trauma history, those things are all associated not only with OCD, um, but with lots of different psychiatric diagnoses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great, great question. Fascinating topic. And another question for the experts. Um... Megan Brooks asks at 728, is there any evidence that people with OCD get over their eating disorders quicker than those without OCD? Great question. Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't think we have data on that. I don't think we have data. 
No, I, mean, I don't have data. I just have clinical experience that they tend to wax and wane. So as you start to recover from OCD, the eating disorder voice can get louder and vice versa. So I think sort of making sure you address both as you go is your best clinical goal. Mm -hmm. Do you think when when people have gone through ERP, though, they've kind of like built up a mindset of challenging their disorders? So maybe it might be easier to combat anorexia? Um, clinically, no, that hasn't been my experience. Eating disorder tends to be more egocentric than OCD. <laughs> um, so, I mean, for those who understand, don't understand the concept, ego dystonic is it doesn't go in line with your values. You, you, you have the thoughts, but you don't have to entirely believe them, but they're still very scary and they feel very real. People with eating disorders, their their obsession tends to be more egocentric, meaning they do want to lose weight. They do want to be in a smaller body. And so that can very much slow down the success and the progress of treatment. So the idea of you want to challenge your OCD, a lot of clients are like, I'm ready, let's go, I want to beat this. But with an eating disorder, usually they don't want to do it because then that their real fear will come true, which is usually that they, if they eat, they will gain weight. And so that is a major clinical um, pivot we have to make in treatment. That's a great point. And Kim, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about how much do you feel like people who have anorexia, they get diagnosed with, with OCD, but it's, it's a mistake that they're what their, their obsessions and compulsions really are part of the eating thing. But a lot of folks tend to look at that and they say, well, you think a lot about something, so that must be an obsession. And you do these repetitive behaviors like playing with your food and all this stuff. Well, that must be a compulsion. And then they get kind of lumped into incorrectly lumped into bona fide OCD. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just curious, you know, cause I've, I've seen folks referred to me, you know, they, they'll call and say, I have OCD. And I ask them, Oh, tell me about your obsessions and compulsions. Well, I think about food all the time and I restrict what I eat. It's like, no, that's not OCD. Who told you that? And yeah. it turns out they have an eating, a body image. Right. Problem. I'm curious yeah. is that a lot. Um, I think luck. I mean, I think that I've been the the area that I live in. Most people have been referred from someone they know what they have. So we're getting people who have have often been through treatment and been misdiagnosed like you. But by the time they get to us, they know exactly what is what. Um, I do actually think um, there is a lot of misdiagnosis. If we stepped out of talking about anorexia and we talk about um, orthorexia which is a type of eating disorder where OCD and the eating disorder very much collide in this very perfect way. It's contamination around food, but the focus isn't on body weight and size and shape. It's on the cleanliness of food. And so that is often where the misdiagnosis happens in my experience. Um, but, you know, again, I'm, we, I am privileged to be in an area where, you know, treatment is very available. People can usually catch the eating disorder pretty quickly, but I know that is not the case in some states in some countries. Cool. And just kind of on the topic of how these disorders present and like telling them apart, like I guess in, in your guys' clinical experiences, how are these disorders similar and how are they different? Like are there key traits that are associated with anorexia and not OCD or is there key traits that bring them together? I'll just uh, jump in. Somebody in the chat actually mentioned uh, there was a question about uh, cognitions. I'm going up in the chat here. The, um, oh, I forget where it was. Like but mindset. Yeah, my yeah, it's mindset. In in OCD, those kinds of fears and compulsive rituals seem to be driven by like what what Kim was saying. Um, the um, you know the, this idea that there's some sort of threat. Uh, to yourself or to someone else, something bad's going to happen um, associated with unwanted intrusive thoughts. So, you know, I think about danger, therefore, you know, that's really going to, you know, I, they take that literally. And so there's, there's, there's a fear component of some, some sort of, you know, disastrous outcome, contamination or harm or mistakes or person becoming someone that they're not like, you know, um, a child molester or an atheist or something like that. Um, violent person. And then the compulsions are about putting that right. Let me do these behaviors so that 
I don't have to worry about those things. And of course, those strategies don't work well. They might get some immediate relief, but in the long run, you know, they um, those strategies backfire. They make the person even more, uh, you know, fearful, more more obsessed. So there's an intolerance of uncertainty. There's an overestimate of risk. Um, my understanding is that uh, you know th those things are fairly specific to OCD, maybe other sorts of anxiety, but that in the eating uh, disorders, you have a different set of, of cognitions focused on body image and things like that. And I'm not as much of an expert on that, but my understanding is that those are those are different than what we see in OCD. Uh, not maybe there's some overlaps, obviously, but um, I don't know. Maybe other mm. people can speak to that. Yeah. So um, the way that I would look at it is how do the obsessions, how are the obsessions similar? So we've talked about their obsessions. They're often intrusive. They're both often repetitive. They're both often unwanted. So that's where they're really aligned. Mm -hmm. um, where they may differ is like I talked about before is um, often eating disorders are ego syntonic. Um, often OCD is ego dystonic, you know, and so that is somewhere where it's often very different. Um, the, the, when we look at compulsions, they're, they're the same action. They're done to relieve a degree of discomfort or distress or suffering that the person is experiencing. Of course, we are human beings and we feed on the idea of solving problems and fixing problems to stay alive. So of course, um, we are going to um, based on thousands of years of, of growth, we're going to try and remove the discomfort that we have. Um, where And so the cycle looks really much the same, mm -hmm. right? Um, where it's important to sort of notice that collide between the two is from, again, the data does, well, there's no way for us to date, like scientifically prove this, but from the eating disorder community, um, the general idea is, OCD tends to be around uncertainty and doubt and eating disorders often tend to be fueled by the wish to not have to really experience or tolerate emotion. Um, some people say that there's a control factor there, that it's a need for control, but they also make that mistake with the OCD, like, oh, you're a control freak, you yeah. know? And, and, I, and we understand that underneath the need for control is actually a deep sense of I don't want to feel my feelings. I don't want that there's often trauma involved with eating disorders as well. Um, and so those may be things, ways that they differ in their presentation and what fuels the disorder. But that's, again, that's an experience that I've had and other clinicians have had. It's not the case for everybody. So if someone's listening to this and that doesn't specifically explain your experience, it doesn't discount it, it's going to be different for everybody. I think the when I ask this question to, when I've asked it to other clinicians, they've often said, well, one, OCD is ego dystonic and then anorexia is ego syntonic. Um, but one thing I've never understood about that is like my, my OCD had always been around me not losing my intelligence. Um, and to me, that sounds egocentonic. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to do, to lose it. So I guess, how would you, how is, how is that kind of differentiated within OCD? Well, everybody, like, why do you say OCD is typically dystonic, I guess? Well, everybody's obsession connects and, and attacks someone's values and your values is what's egocentric. You want to be intellectual. You want to be smart. And so that's always going to be egocentric. But mm -hmm. the obsession in and itself is what's ego dystonic, right? The, if you don't tap, if you tap on this, I'm, I'm making this up. I'm not tell, saying this is what your experience, but if you tap this three times, well, then you can prevent yourself from becoming not intellectual they can usually identify the ego dystonic nature of that. But your value of wanting to be a smart person is mm -hmm. always going to be ego syntonic, if that makes sense. You, do, then, you don't, you don't want to have the thought that maybe you're going to lose your intelligence. Yeah. Right. Like that's, that's the ego dystonic part of it. Those right. thoughts are against who you, you know, who you are, what you want. Okay. And then in anorexia, they, it is in line with the value uh, whether it be culturally mediated or not, of looking a particular way or focusing on a body in a particular way. Yeah. Often, often, not always, but often. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, for the eating disorder person, yeah. But definitely for the OCD 
you know, experience. Yes. Um, we're getting a lot of questions in the chat. I'm getting overwhelmed, but um, a lot of questions are about treatment. But before we get there, I want to address uh, Mackenzie Page, who just gave a question at 740. Um, would the underlying fear contribute to both OCD and eating disorders where the behaviors are seen as a safety or coping mechanism? For example, if this behavior is performed, I will be safe. If I restrict uh, what I am eating, I will feel worthy, valued, et cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. This is where, again, I, I personally really resonate with the OCD crowd, right? Like I just, I feel like I'm, they get me and I get them because it, it we're doing a behavior to try and get the thing that you want, whether that be safety or certainty or relief of your discomfort. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's where, but I also would say that's also very human of us, right? To want to relieve mm -hmm. thoughts and feelings and sensations and urges and images that create discomfort in us. That's what connects us all humans is the, the wish for safety and, and, you know, no risk. I'm, this is all. It's getting, it's getting too like gray for this black and white neuroscience major. I need, <laughs> I need more concrete stuff. So, Jim, I'm gonna talk to you. You're my concrete friend. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> like in terms of the neurobiology of these two disorders, because I also want to get into making kind of a diagnosis, and the DSM is kind of predicated on, on this idea that. You know, we're going to have these diagnostic categories until we get to some like tangible brain stuff. So in terms mm -hmm. of the brain stuff, how do these disorders shake out? Do they look very similar? Are there common changes that we see in both? Um, uh, I'm afraid that the answer, there's not enough data yet, is um, also applies to this area. But I think for OCD, uh, there is a lot of data supporting the uh, corticostriatal thalamocortical or CTSC circuit in OCD. I see you cheating there. I'm looking at notes. <laughs> <that. laughs> I had to read that one off my notes. Um, yeah, so that is, you know, I think there's a lot of imaging data, uh, both functional and structural, supporting that. Uh, anorexia, I'm not as familiar with, but I think a lot of the reward and feeding circuits are involved as well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that there's been a definitive study comparing the two or, you know, looking, I don't know that there are going to be black and white concrete differences between the two. Um, but uh, yeah, I think a lot of more research is, is needed. That's for sure. I'm just stranded here, basically. <laughs> I feel like I uh, want to appease you and just tell you something black and white. <laughs> no, I mean, the truth is I don't, I don't think it, there's a black and white answer. <laughs> yeah. No, um, when you guys see clients, do they do they tend to like use different words when they're describing these disorders? Like, does it seem like there's kind of a different theme when they're describing it? More like fear and one or something in the other? Is that a question for me? Or anyone? Well, Generally speaking, I think that OCD tends to be more on uncertainty, right? Okay. The, you know, or disgust, right? It can also be disgust based. So I think that's very true for people with um, OCD. For eating disorders, it, it would be so nice to have a single box, but it's often very um, broad in what's going on for the person. And, and, and yeah, in general, we could say, the goal is to have a sense of controlling what we don't have control over, which is our body. You know, that's it, that's a big one. But often, again, it's there's a lot of um, ego underneath that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I want to feel powerful. I want to feel strong. I want to feel better than. I want to feel like I have uh, some kind of cultural platform to be on with social media. It's actually being reinforced every day. Um, eating disorders are going through the roof with social media right now. They're being encouraged. They're being, you know, there's even challenges to see who can get the biggest eating disorder, which I don't see with eat, with OCD. So that's where um, it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. And in terms of kind of treatment, um, Lisette Cortez said something a little bit earlier up. I need to find the comment. Um 
at 7.31, she said, I wonder if core beliefs make a difference in the presentation of EDs versus the presentation of OCD. Uh, these are often challenged in traditional ED treatment, but as we know, cognitive restructuring is often not helpful in treating OCD. Well, and, and that's the comment I was looking for before. Um, <laughs> right, you, you can't talk someone out of OCD using cognitive restructuring. You can do exposure therapy, and that is a better cognitive therapy than cognitive restructuring, actually, because what exposure does is it helps people challenge, it helps people experientially, you know, challenge their own predictions and, and fears. Um, mm -hmm. You, We know that that doesn't work as well for, for anorexia, um, those kinds of cognitive strategies. Um, and again, I think it's for reasons that Kimberly was talking about before, it's just harder for folks, because of the egocentric nature, it's harder for them to want to challenge um, those, those the their core beliefs. I don't know, Kimberly. You probably can speak to that better than I. Yeah, can. and I think it's important too that we highlight that often there is a secondary diagnosis of body dysmorphic disorder for people with OCD, with sorry, eating disorders and anorexia as well. And we do a lot of cognitive restructuring with BDD. Um, because of, of, you know, environmental risk factors. Um, and often it can be related to the family system and what's expected to be accepted in the family system as well. You know, and then we start looking at social anxiety and then the disorder. That's why we call it obsessive compulsive related disorders because, you know, again, even we've got skin picking and hair pulling that can get involved at this level as well. Um, so I, I think that, yes, with eating disorders, we do use a lot of you know correcting thoughts the cool thing is with both and cognitive skills you can use with both is looking at your mindset around tolerating discomfort and that's one area you can target for the folks with both is to use use this one opportunity to remind yourself like i can tolerate this through exposure um, but also just you can do some cognitive restructuring, but not to reduce the uncertainty that the person with OCD has. And is there any kind of, I guess, indication as to why cognitive restructuring just doesn't work in OCD? And it might in the, a, how effective is it in AN? What is like the traditional treatment model for that as well? Those are two questions that I don't know the answer to either. <laughs> I can speak to the OCD part, but what cognitive restructuring essentially is, is helping people do rituals. Uh, folks with OCD often spend a lot of time in their head trying to figure out how dangerous is this, um, mm -hmm. asking other people for, for reassurance, uh, figuring, learning to, you know, well, trying to figure out risk. Um, and in cognitive restructuring, what we're doing is we're basically helping them to, to, to do that. To, we're, we're doing it. Now it's sanctioned by the therapist. Let's look at the evidence. Let's look at the data. What would someone else say about this? And instead, okay. if you're going to help someone to be better at managing uncertainty, what you want to do is give all that stuff up, have them go into the situation and not analyze it to death, um, but instead learn, I don't, I don't have to know the answer to these things. And instead learn I can go in the situation, I can bring on that discomfort, that anxiety, those intrusive thoughts, and I can have that while I do the things that are that are important to me in, in my life. I don't have to be okay. I don't have to feel good. I don't have to feel reassured in order to um, you know, do more stuff, do the things that are that matter to me in my life. And to quickly follow on that, that it's exactly the same with eating disorder treatment. So even though the obsession is egocentric, mm -hmm. right, you still eat the burrito. This is me, right, in, in eating disorder recovery, like eat the burrito, right? So I eat the burrito. Even though it doesn't, I, I, it's egocentric, I still do it. And I learn that I can tolerate the consequences of eating the burrito, which is gaining weight. It is watching your body change. It's the same. It's it's giving up the need for control of that. And through that, once you start eating the burrito and going to the party and, and living your life, you start to then want recovery more than you want the thinness. Mm -hmm. So it, it, the restructuring is still through the behavioral change. Mm -hmm. It just sounds like you may sit down with your clients more and say like, 
like, is it rational that you're going to gain X amount of pounds if you eat this one burrito? Rather, where John would, wouldn't would sit down with someone with OCD and say, like, is it rational that, you know, Kyle, you're going to lose all your intelligence if you touch that door three times? Yeah. I wouldn't talk about whether it's rational. We'd talk about coping if that were to come true, right? So we wouldn't be saying it's not possible. You won't gain weight, I promise you. In fact, that actually adds to the fat phobia that the person with eating disorder has and usually we have to work through that fat phobia right which is Mm -hmm. you know again environmentally exposed to us so it's working through can you hold space for yourself in any body can you let go go of the need to be in disgust if you were to gain weight and can you actually work with that and pivot in that cognitively and have and see that your worth doesn't decrease your value doesn't decrease, your lovability doesn't decrease as your body changes. And Mm -hmm. so that's where we don't talk about um, it. That's not going to happen because, you know, I always say to my clients, don't ask me for reassurance because I actually don't have the answer to your question. Right. Right. And I would say the same to an eating disorder. I don't know. Some people go through, I'm privileged to have gone through eating disorder recovery and, and not had to land in a, in a bigger body. Some people, you know, recovery is in different shapes for everybody. And Mm -hmm. so I think it's really important that we, in eating disorder recovery, we're really looking at that fat phobia and and looking at how that's been, um, that's a a real um, engine that drives the eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And it also sounds like there is, I guess, something that is synonymous with exposures in eating disorder treatment, to some extent. Is that right? We do them the same. They look the same. We have this. And because they have the same, what I will say, excuse me, let me start again. The treatment for my OCD eating disorder clients looks a little different than just my only eating disorder clients because we try to make all the treatment look the same and sound the same so Mm -hmm. that they're not constantly changing treatment manuals and changing mindset that they know that the system is the same the process is the same. We apply the same tools to the same thing. Um, and that, except for the work around fat phobia and that, it tends to work really well. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm slowly starting to get there. <laughs> um, wait, I just had another question. But when I, while I think of it, I'll read Victoria's question at a 747. Regarding treatment for comorbid AN and OCD, if when would you opt to treat the OCD compulsions before the AN? So I don't want to take over too much. So please, does anyone else want to answer? How dare you, Kimberly? Go ahead. Yeah, you. So yeah. we do tend to look at the anorexia first because it tends to have a higher health risk. And we're always going to treat the thing that that impacts health first, right? That's the duty we have as clinicians, as health is number one. And so we actually will always do an assessment for the health risks and refer to a doctor if need. The thing to remember here is we do have to be aware of what we call refeeding syndrome, which is if you start, if you've been low calorie and you overdo that and pushed too much calories at once, there can be medical side effects. So we do look at that first, Um, make sure we've got a treatment team, a dietitian on the team, that's something we have to plan for, right? There's a timeline. Whereas with OCD, boom, we can do an exposure today if you want to. Um, so in regards to the question, when would you opt to do OCD compulsions? That would only be the case if that was the primary diagnosis and there were no health risks. And on that note, which one tends to be kind of a more aggressive disorder, if you will, and, and harder to treat and takes more time to remit? Or does it just depend on the patient entirely? Depends. Depends on insight. It depends. Insight is a huge one. Um, it depends. What on is the, insight? Just their ability to identify the problem, right? So some people who have OCD or who have eating disorder go, "I don't have a problem. You're the problem. I'm. Mm-hmm. I'm I don't have a problem. You know, if everyone I don't have was a problem. <laughs> yeah, if, if I didn't have, if I, if no, if everyone would just leave me alone, I'd be fine, right? So insight is a huge piece of this. Um, access to care is another one. Um, willingness to recover. A lot of e- a lot of people 
I tend to see more eating disorder clients that are this way, but it's not true is they don't want recovery. They're not ready for recovery yet. Often my mm -hmm. clients have OCD. I'm more likely like I'm in some kind of hell, get me out of here. Whereas the eating disorder clients sometimes will say, I'm, I'm, I don't want to recover. I want, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I remember my question now. It kind of goes along with um, something Megan typed at 750. She said she's always been confused about the cause um, of her anorexia nervosa. And on that note, um, I was you mentioned that anorexia tends to be tied up with trauma or can be tied up with trauma. Um, and I wanted to ask both you and John, do these disorders tend to have different kind of like roots, if you will? Does OCD tend to come up out of nowhere more often than an eating disorder? Or does an eating disorder tend to be triggered by something and OCD is also just as often triggered by something? In OCD, we can see it come up out of nowhere. It tends to start, you know, I think the, the modal or the, the typical time of onset is late teens, early 20s. But you do have kids, you know, lots of kids who get that, unfortunately. And sometimes you see folks that are much older. Sometimes it just occurs kind of, you know, out of the blue, sometimes there is some sort of event uh, that that triggers it. People are not that good at identifying the those kinds of things. Our memory for you know things in the past, especially when these disorders tend to develop gradually over time, mm -hmm. and it's you know it's hard for people to to accurately point to. Oh yeah, this was you know this was when it when it started. We're just not research shows that. We're just not good at, at, at that. Um, so it's it's really hard to know. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just going to air a, a, a grievance I have because I'm on, I have a, a presence on social media. The thing that worries me the most that I see is this idea that it's trauma trapped in your body. And that can be really scary for people who that you know particularly people with OCD who is like what I have trauma stuck in me like how do I get it out you know that can be incredibly you know stressful so I'm always really careful around the uh, the conversation around cause um, because I do think it's easy to get stuck with obsessions around like what is the cause and be focused so much I usually really uh, ask and offer the opportunity for clients is let's actually do the most compassionate thing and not try and solve that for now. Um, once you're fully recovered and you, if you want to go and explore that with your another clinician, by all means, but let's actually, the most compassionate thing we can do is to break that cycle and put our attention there. Um, yeah. so that's, that's my personal preference. Uh, you guys can um, agree or disagree, but that that's what I found to be most helpful. Jim, I was kind of, as you're discussing that question, a question came up in my head. Considering OCD and anorexia separately, um, do we have kind of more evidence about, or does one seem to be more genetic than the other? Or are they both about 50-50? They're both, they're pretty similar. Yeah, I'd say on a spectrum from, say, depression to schizophrenia, depression being of lower heritability, maybe 20-25%. Schizophrenia mm -hmm. being at the high, like 75% genetic. Anorexia and OCD seem to be somewhere in the middle, around 50 50. Um, yeah, it's. it's so, in neat. either case, are there like consistent large scale mutations that pop up? It's all just little ones. Generally, I mean, it, there are, there's a lot of work going on right now with rare variation um, that are more impactful variations, but uh, we don't have enough data yet to really know how often those occur, uh, but that work is ongoing. Hey, Jim, do we know what exactly is, when we say it's heritable, what does that mean? What's what's actually inherited? Um, you know, so OCD is not like diabetes where there's a problem that we can see in terms of how we make insulin and sugar and all that stuff. OCD is multi, you know, it's, it's a complex combination of things do we know what what does that mean when we say it's inherit it's that it's heritable yeah. what what specifically is heritable yeah it really comes from um twin and family studies uh and adoption as well so classic genetic studies that have been done decades for decades or mostly in the 70s 80s and 90s i would say for ocd and, and an yeah um so it's really looking at risk 
to relatives. Uh, that's really how it's defined. Um, but heritability is like the fraction of variation that's thought to be due to genetics. And it's really defined through these rates in, in relatives. So, so we don't know what, what, you know, what is, so genes code for proteins. So what are the proteins? I, I guess we, you know, we don't, we don't know in the body what, what that actually means. Well, there's, we have a much larger study going on. I didn't mention it earlier, but um, thankfully sample size has increased markedly for both AN and OCD. So studies that will come out in the next year or two will be tenfold larger than what's been published. And before the resolution on the gene level was very low, like we couldn't tell you gene X is you know, involved in OCD specifically. We could only say like brain express genes are important, but with the greater resolution that we're getting now, uh, we will be able to name genes, name proteins, uh, probably name pathways, uh, biological pathways that are involved. Um, so we're getting there. Uh, we just need patience. Uh, with uh, these studies are large, they're expensive, and they're time consuming. And uh, you know, I wish it wasn't that way. I wish it was easier. But these are very complicated disorders with a lot of genes involved. Yeah, uh, that's why it's so complicated. Yeah, I mean, it would be great to 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 know, yeah, specifically what is it that those genes are coding for, mm -hmm. and and yeah, no, and that way we can start to get some idea of like what really is, yeah, what what is going on. Yeah, yeah, I right? think yeah, it is coming. I know it's, we've been saying that as geneticists for a long time, but uh, <laughs> we are finally getting there. Changes in technology have really helped. Right. And the decreasing costs of genotyping and sequencing have made all the all the world a difference. Yeah. They may have helped you, but they're a pain when I had to learn them in bio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we are over time, and I want to be conscious of everyone's time. So um, I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. I had like a whole like plan about how this was going to go and like what topics we were going to cover when, and then everyone just started talking. So everything went off the railroad, uh, the, the tracks there. But um, thank you for everyone for coming out. If we didn't get to your question, you can go ahead and email it to me at kyle.king at yale.edu and I will give it to the right person to answer it. Don't worry, I will not try to answer it myself. Um, also, just to be aware, there is a Just Ethan, uh, another live stream tomorrow at 7 p.m. And then there's Chris's Corner Wednesday at 12 p.m. And there's another town hall Thursday at 7 p.m. So there's a lot of additional live streams to be looking forward to this week. All those times we're in um, Eastern time, by the way. If you need resources about OCD, and there is actually a great article about the intersection between OCD and anorexia on the IRCDS website, if you look that up. But if you want resources about OCD in general, go ahead and visit the IRCDF.org. Remember to like and subscribe. Um, thank you to our panelists for showing up. And I'm sorry that I had to cut it out early. I was very interested. Um, and thank you for everyone for coming. Yeah. Great job, yeah. Kyle. Once again, you're a master MC. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate perfect. it.